Good evening, this is VK3EKH, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 Charlie Sierra Juliet in Narry Warren, South Melbourne. Good evening to everybody tuning in for the first time and welcome to tonight's session this 27th of May 2022. We are broadcasting on 3541 kHz in the 80 meter amateur radio band SSP tonight and simulcasting on 160 meters on 1865 kHz amplitude modulation. We're also broadcasting via the Melbourne Television Digital Repeater VK3 RTV channel digital channel number 1. Good evening to folks watching there on the TV. We are also streaming via my YouTube channel to the World Wide Web. And you can see that by going to the YouTube channel and typing in VK3CSJ and look for the live symbol. And there you'll get uh, full HD of tonight's uh, transmissions. Uh, we also have an email address. So uh, throughout the hour, uh, if you wish to send signal reports or vision reports, <laughs> Uh, you uh, may do so to uh, vk3ekh at gmail.com vk3ekh at gmail.com and I am looking at the in inbox as we speak well a little bit to the side well it's actually you can actually see it in view on the camera there uh, we also have a discord chat window and the discord chat window can be found via the ASV website um, at uh, www.asv.org.au that's www.asv.org.au go across to the radio astronomy tab and uh, look this little pull down box and you'll see the link to the uh, ASV radio broadcast and within that page lies the link to the discord chat window and you can come up as uh, an alias or an alien uh, or uh, your real name or ID or something or other, it doesn't matter. Uh, we also, um, uh, there is, uh, that's about it actually for the uh, coverage tonight. Uh, we're on our USB camera tonight, same as last week. I just like the wide angle effect this uh, USB camera uh, gives um, as opposed to my JVC uh, camera which is uh, not so wide. But uh, I think the image looks reasonably good, I suppose. A bit bright on my face there, isn't it? But anyway... Um, all right. I hope everybody uh, enjoyed the uh, the broadcast last week, uh, courtesy of uh, astrophys.com, Brendan O'Brien, <coughs> and uh, Dr. Susie Shi. I've had good favourable reports of uh, the uh, the session last week, particularly the uh, also broadcasting AM on uh, on 80 metres did uh, go across very well. So, again, thanks for everybody for uh, the reports uh, for last week. But uh, tonight's just an ordinary session, <laughs> nothing particularly special about tonight. We've got several articles to uh, read out. Um, we also have um, a uh, space weather report from uh, uh, from Tamitha. Uh, Timothy, Timothy Skolv and uh, she's um, uh, going to be talking about her report covers the last four days or so so it's a kind of a lead up to this weekend I guess anyway I trust everything is going through okay and um, uh, I haven't uh, heard any reports in the background so I guess uh, Audio is okay on all channels and that's going to uh, to air. Uh, dear me. All right. So let's see. Uh, I went pretty much straight into the, uh, the the program last week, so I, I left out a lot of the usual stuff. But uh, g'day, Martin too. I can see Martin's uh, tuned in there on the Discord channel. <coughs> Uh, the Astronomical Society of Victoria was founded in 1922. It uh, comprises well over 1,600 members scattered through the state of Victoria and Australia and overseas. Membership of the Society is open to all persons with an interest in astronomy. The Society's objectives are to encourage the study and practice of astronomy, to disseminate the knowledge of the science and to provide greater facilities for the study among its members. 
Monthly meetings are held usually on the second Wednesday of each month, except in January, uh, the latter being held on a Saturday night. Meetings start at 8pm at the Mulia Hall National Herbarium uh, in Burwood Avenue, Melbourne and near the Melbourne Observatory, which is located adjacent to the Shrine of Remembrance. Parking is available in Burwood Avenue, Dellas Brooks Drive and the surrounding streets. Admission is free and visitors are most welcome. Privileges of membership include the right to borrow books, periodicals and other publications from the Society's extensive library located at the Melbourne Observatory. Receipt of the ASV's magazine crux containing articles, news, observing notes and the like and the free provision of the Astronomical Yearbook. Access is available to telescopes on members' nights held regularly at the Melbourne Observatory and, uh, and after the monthly meetings weather permitting. These instruments include the Society's 300mm equatorial reflector and a 300mm portable reflector. There's also a 200mm reflector managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens and a photoheliograph are also housed at the observatory and are accessible to members as well. The Society also has a number of 200mm ref reflectors available for short period loan to members. Try before you buy. Regular Society Club Night meetings are held on the first and last Fridays of each month at the Lodge, the Society's property in Burwood. Members are encouraged to use the Society's instruments located there to gain first-hand experience in telescope use. These instruments include a 508mm equatorial reflector and a number of smaller reflectors. Members are also encouraged to make use of the Society's country property located near Heathcote, some 90 minute drive north of Melbourne. There are a range of instruments available for members to use and uh, the larger two only with appropriate training. Which range from 300mm to 1000mm in aperture. Also located on site is the 8.5 metre radio fully steerable telescope uh, which members can access with involvement in the radio astronomy section. Members are encouraged to make and use telescopes. Advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same. Instrument making is one is only one of the number of common interest activities catered for within the society. Other areas of interest that members can participate in include deep sky observing, astrophotography, lunar and planetary observing, auroral, meteor, comet and radio astronomy, computing, cosmology and astrophysics, historical studies and research and astronomy in general. Contact details for various section directors are provided in the book. Further information may be attained by visiting the ASV website and notifications of events are given in the Crux Extra Bulletins sent out via email to members. Please note that the ASV will confirm, conform to all government health directives. ASV events may be required to be cancelled, moved or postponed. You may find further information by writing to the Secretary, the Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001, that's the Secretary, the Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001. But having said all that, of course the ASV's website <coughs> at www.asv.org.au is all where it is and can be revealed. Um, so, well, yes, it's all there. Um, yeah, you're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. Very pleasant good evening to Richard, VK3 VRS. It's joined the chat window and also Martin. I've already mentioned that, haven't I? <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. All righty then. So let's see uh, what else is there in respect to all that. Uh, let me just check my uh, main page here. Uh, if you do go visiting the Astronomical Society of Victoria's homepage, um, you will see a revolving banner, and occasionally it'll come up membership. 
and uh, to become a member of the ASV is an easy peasy Japanesey thing and uh, it's uh, the uh, uh, where it says membership is open to all interested in astronomy uh, of course uh, that's a link so you just click on membership and away you go uh, anyway look there's a there's a, a swag of things happening we've, we've got a we've got a new president um, for the ASV Mark Ascario he's the guy with the funny colored hair and <laughs> And um, um, I'm trying to think of something else funny there, but I won't. Uh, I won't. I won't go there. But uh, anyway, he's uh, he's <laughs> he's bringing the astro astronomical society into the future, and uh, he's got a whole lot of ideas there. And you can you can pretty much see it from the home page uh, where he's aiming for. So uh, just visit the site website and all will be uh, revealed one way or another. He's very much into raffles. Um, <laughs> g'day Mark if you're listening. Uh, yeah, alright, so there it is. Um, we've, there's a club section meeting tonight happening um, between 8 and 11pm. So uh, club section meetings are informal and take place on the first and last Fridays of the month. So we've got a a section meeting, a club section meeting happening as we speak. Um, this uh, Saturday there is a deep sky section meeting which is uh, usually done up at the dark sky site as far as I know. Uh, there's a solar section meeting on Sunday and uh, 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 um, yes and just looking here uh, again you can just check the website out and, and as you go down the page it just reveals what is coming up uh, in um, in June so we are coming up to the end of the month next f next Friday we should have sky notes for June so that's uh, something to look forward to what's happening up in the sky for June uh, so there it is all right just dragging out the process here a little bit aren't I uh, good grief. Anyway, there it is. Um, okay, you're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 EKH. All right, well, look, the first item of interest tonight to have a bit of a talk about is about this uh, amazing image of the black hole that's been uh, imaged um, for at the center of our galaxy. And uh, this article, courtesy of astronomy.com, is how did astronomers take a picture of our galaxy's supermassive black hole you might ask yourself there is a three images i think i have to show here so if, if you're not receiving the melbourne tv repeater um, turn on that computer in your shack or your tablet or even in your mobile phone will do and uh, go to youtube and type in VK3CSJ in the YouTube search engine and you will find me there in full HD. Anyway, I'll just bring up this image of uh, what's been collected. Everybody's basically seen this, uh, but um, I have to make sure my audio stays here when I do this. Uh, yes, it is. Good. The audio is still there. Excellent stuff. All right, so what you're seeing on the screen, and I have to remember, there's another couple of images I want to show you here, so I'll, I'll try to remember to change those as I read out this article. Um, so, uh, this image you're seeing on the screen at the moment uh, is the event horizon, well, it's, it's actually an image from uh, what we call the event horizon telescope. Uh, the event horizon telescope, or EHT, Extremely high tension is another acronym one could use. <laughs> the Event Horizon Telescope uh, collaboration released the first ever image of the accretion disk around the Milky Way's supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A, on May 12, 2022. And that's what you're seeing there. So, as I say, last week the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration delivered its second stunning and haunting image of the accretion disk around a black hole and this time the picture captured Sagittarius A the supermassive black hole that lurks at the heart of our own Milky Way galaxy some 26,000 light years away despite being released in 2022 
The EHT collaboration collected the data for this historic shot back in 2017. But why did it take them half a decade to process the data and generate a final image? The answer is that this type of astronomy is hard, very hard. Let me go through some basics of interferometry. The first step to generate an image of Sagittarius A is to build a telescope capable of seeing it. But no single instrument has the resolving power necessary to capture the accretion disk around our supermassive black hole, let alone its event horizon. That's why astronomers often turn to a trick called interferometry to boost the resolution of hard to image targets. By using multiple telescopes in tandem, they can combine the data from each and the farther apart the individual telescopes, the greater the resolution they can ultimately achieve. Now I've got one other image here I'll just bring up. Let me do that. There it is. Okay. So, of course, the boost in resolution provided by interferometry comes at a cost. For starters, you lose a lot of potential data. Photons that strike the ground between the telescopes can't be used in your analysis. You can partially overcome this challenge by adding more telescopes to the interferometer network and by observing over the course of hours, letting the natural rotation of the Earth help your telescopes overcome more ground, or to cover more ground, more precisely. Interferometers also require a massive amount of data processing, as astronomers must correlate together all the individual data streams from each telescope. For most interferometers, like the Very Large Array in New Mexico, or the Akatema Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array in Chile, Akakama is how I think that's pronounced. I always get that caught over that word, Akakama, <laughs> Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array in Chile. This is achieved by simply connecting the telescopes together with physical cables into a central processing correlator. But for a global spanning interferometer like the EHT, that hardware approach just is not possible. To achieve the resolution required to image the Milky Way supermassive black hole, the Event Horizon Telescope needed to span the width of our entire planet, employing telescopes in North America, South America, Europe and Antarctica. Without any physical cabling, the EHT team had to record every single bit collected by the telescopes during the observing run, <coughs> sampling the data up to 64 billion times per second. Each observing run, which typically ran for only a few days, or only a few days, yep, yeah, a few days, generate a truly enormous amount of data. The team stored the data from each telescope on a set of hard drives, which they then had to physically transport to the MIT Haystack Observatory and the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy for processing. Another delay came from every astronomer's enemy, the atmosphere. While our, teles while our atmosphere is great for providing the air we need to, build to, to live, it's terrible for observing. Significant weathered events or even just basic clouds can totally ruin a planned observing run. The EHT team had to monitor the weather forecasts at each of their telescopes locations scattered around the world, waiting for the right time to use all the instruments at once. For Sagittarius A, that moment came in April of 2017. Once the observations were completed and the physical data storage drives were safely returned to the two headquarters, it was time to process everything and that's when calibration became key. When astronomers point their instruments at a new object like Sagittarius A, they don't initially know whether they are seeing light emitted from their target or some other source of contamination. 
The first common source of contamination is the atmosphere itself, yes again. There is more than 60 miles or 100 kilometers of air between us and the vacuum of space and it is constantly shifting. With pockets of warm and cool air competing for dominance, every time the atmosphere shifts it slightly changes our view of celestial targets. To account for this, the EHT team de dedicated a fraction of each observing run to training their instruments on a well-known radio source. They then used observed variations in that source to create, to create a real-time model of atmospheric disturb turbulence and its effect on Sagittarius A data, allowing them to remove any atmospheric distortions. Beyond the atmosphere, there is also a lot of galactic material between us and Sagittarius A, about 26,000 light years worth, and while interstellar space is almost a vacuum, it isn't perfectly so, meaning dust grains throughout the galaxy interfere with radio emissions picked up by the Event Horizon Telescope. One effect of the dust is to gently scatter the radio waves coming from Sagittarius A, making it appear broader than it really is. The second effect is that large random clumps of interstellar dust introduce small blotches that aren't a part of the black hole system at all. That meant the team had to work hard to develop models of those effects before they could likewise subtract from the, the, uh, the from from the final image of our home galaxy's black hole. There's just another image I'll bring up here too which shows something of this process. <clears throat> Lastly, gonna make sure I'm on the right paragraph here. Lastly, astronomers had to consider the inherent variability present in the disk surrounding Sagittarius A. Itself previous, uh, itself, full stop. Previous, much lower resolution observations suggest that our supermassive black hole's disk can double its brightness over the course of only a few years or less. Astronomers have even caught the occasional flare popping up around the black hole and disappearing within a single day. The EHT team needed to train their telescopes on Sagittarius A for several hours. They required all that data to ensure the signal clearly rose above the noise. Otherwise, the observation would be so noisy it would be nearly useless. But because the black hole's disk changed and varied in brightness over all that time, it was like taking a picture of a dog chasing its tail. The team couldn't simply combine several hours worth of data into a signal blurry mess. To tackle this, the team divided the data streams into small chunks, no longer than a few minutes each. They then processed each chunk separately, then combined all the clean, then combined all the clean chunks together to make a single average image. As a self-check for consistency, the team used separate software pipelines with different methods of for cleaning and processing the data. The end result of all this work, years f uh, after years of preparation, days of observation and years of analysis, is a gorgeous portrait of the gravitational Goliath hiding in the center of our galaxy, Sagittarius A. That image you're seeing on the screen there, they say here, using ray tracing and Einstein theory of general relativity, the EHT team created numerous depictions of what the Milky Way's supermassive black hole might look like. So there's a whole bunch of images there that they, they created from the data they collected uh, uh, for um, uh, imaging what the, the black hole might look like. <laughs> it's uh, up to you to choose which one looks the best, I suppose. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, the one that they went with, of course, is, uh, is this one here. So, um, pretty cool stuff, really, what they can do. <clears throat> and, you know, the, the resolution on the sky is, uh, is uh, 
you know, a really, really amazing stuff. Really amazing stuff. All right, you're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Narry Warren South. A very pleasant good evening to uh, Don, VK3HDX, who's uh, sent me a report in there. Thanks, Don. Andrew, VK3KIS, and I got your report. Uh, I was trying to find your email, but I couldn't find it for tonight, but it doesn't matter. Next week. There's always next week. Uh, and uh, there's another bro- there's another email here. Oops, wrong mouse. Um, let me have a look at this. Just go up here. Excuse me for a moment while we look at this other email that's come in. Uh, oh, Stuart. Oh, g'day, Stuart. VK3UAO. Howdy doody. Um, good copy in northern suburbs of Melbourne on 80 metres. Yes, it's SSB tonight, Stuart. <laughs> I just decided to go with SSB tonight. <sighs> anyway, next week I might do AM. Anyway, good to, uh, to see you, Stuart. No worries at all. One of our Geloso friends. <laughs> all right. Now, uh, there's something coming up uh, in the next month. There's not much to really, really read on this in the uh, website, but uh, they're calling it um, the Neighbourhood Earth, the Ultimate Space Experience. Um, it starts on the 15th of June, Wednesday the 15th of June. I don't know whether it's just the one day or whether it's over a week or something. It might say it here somewhere. Yeah, I think it does. There it is. Um, okay, so in a nutshell, uh, Neighbourhood Earth is the ultimate space experience. This award-winning exhibition combines the latest science and cutting-edge technology to tell the, the story of space exploration like never before. Now You have to buy tickets. There is obviously a cost to all this. I won't go into that. Uh, but the highlights of this is uh, Neighbourhood Earth tells the story of space exploration like never before. Immersive cinema experience with cutting-edge technology, 360-degree projection, 8.1 surround sound and all centered around a protection a projection map dome uh, it's been developed by the Toto Creative uh, group in conjunction with the US Space and Rocket Center and NASA's George C Marshall Space Flight Center um, highly educational and fun learning zone developed in line with STEM principles including interactive holographic systems and hands-on activities uh, perfect for families, students and science and history enthusiasts. The general info, it's running from, okay, here it is. It's running from the dates of the 15th of June to the 28th of August this year. Uh, the opening hours is something like Wednesdays, Saturdays and Sundays. Um, well, it's got, what, it's got, what it's got here is Wednesdays, Saturdays and Sundays from 11 a.m. to, to 8 p.m. Uh, last entry being 6.30 p.m. on those days. Then you've also got Thursday and Fridays at 11 a.m. to 9 p.m. Last entry at 7.30 p.m. The duration is 1 hour and 30 minutes. Location is the Emporium at Melbourne, wherever that is. Uh, all ages are welcome. Uh, accessibility, this venue is wheelchair accessible. And what else can I say? Um, description. Uh, get ready for a an immersive space adventure. Neighbourhood Earth is an award-winning exhibition combining the latest science and cutting-edge technology to create the ultimate space experience. With 360-degree projection and 8.1 sound, surround sound, as mentioned before, and a giant projection mapped dome, the exhibition's key set piece will transport you to space inside an epic cinematic environment, tapping into the into your desire to travel to a whole new world. Explore space artifacts, museum quality models, and example of spacecraft tools and astronaut suits, as well as many fun and engaging learning activities, perfect for all ages. Enjoy time together while learning about our closest celestial neighbor. There it is. That's it. I'm not going to carry on any more about that. Uh, it's called Neighborhood Earth. Neighborhood Earth. Um, 
Neighborhood Earth, the ultimate space experience. Exper experience. <laughs> uh, so that's between June and August. And uh, just, uh, just type in Neighborhood Earth in your favorite search engine and you'll get all that information. But I think that would be great for the kids. So there it is. It's a bit of a plug for that. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 EKH, where the time is half past ten. Okay, I've got a bunch of short articles here tonight, thank goodness. Um, all right, now this is a image here of Mara's. It's kind of a, an artist's drawing, actually. And there it is. Okay, let's quickly go to this article. <sighs> okay. The question that is being asked, could people breathe the air on Mars? Mars is the fourth planet from the Sun and one of our closest neighbors in space, but it's not a very welcoming place for an, Earth, for an Earthling to visit. May 23rd, 2022. The picture you're seeing on the screen as I speak is this is an artist concept from January 1989 images, a scene where humans are working on the Martian surface. There it is. <laughs> so, um, this was a question that was put forth by a young guy by the, at the age of seven. And, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, Jackie's name is Jack, age seven. So, let's suppose you were an astronaut who just landed on the planet Mars. What would you need to survive? For starters, here's a short list. Water, food, shelter, and oxygen. Oxygen is the air we breathe here on Earth. Plants and some kinds of bacteria provide it for us. But oxygen is not the only gas in the Earth's atmosphere. It's not even the most abundant. In fact, only 21% of our air is made up of oxygen. Almost all the rest is nitrogen, about 78%. Now, you might be wondering, if there's more nitrogen in the air, why do we breathe oxygen? Well, here, here's how it works. Technically, when you breathe in, you take in everything that's in the atmosphere, but your body uses only the oxygen you get rid of the rest when you exhale. The air on Mars. The Martian's atmosphere is thin. Its volume is only 1% of the Earth's atmosphere. To put it another way, there's 99% less, 99 less air on Mars than on Earth. That's partly because Mars is about half the size of Earth. Its gravity isn't strong enough to keep atmosphere gases from escaping into space. And the most abundant gas in that thin, at, in thin air is carbon dioxide. For people on Earth, that's a poisonous gas at high concentrations. Fortunately, it makes up far less than 1% of our atmosphere, but on Mars, carbon dioxide is 96% of the air atmosphere. Meanwhile, Mars has almost no oxygen. It's only one-tenth of 1% 1 of the air, not nearly enough for humans to survive. If you try to breathe on the surface of Mars without a space suit supplying your oxygen, it's a bad idea. You would die in an instant. You would suffocate. And because of the low atmospheric pressure, your blood would boil, both at about the same time. So, life without oxygen. So far, researchers have not found any evidence of life on Mars. But the search is just beginning. Our robotic probes have barely scratched the surface. Without a question, Mars is an extreme environment, and it's not just the air. Very little liquid water is on the Martian surface. Temperatures are incredibly cold at night. It's more than minus 73 degrees Celsius. But plenty of organisms on Earth survive extreme environments. Life has been around in, in the Antarctic ice, at the bottom of the ocean, and miles below the Earth's surface. Many of those places have extremely hot or cold temperatures, almost no water and little to no oxygen. And even if life no longer exists on Mars, maybe it did billions of years ago when it had a thicker atmosphere. 
more oxygen, warmer temperatures and significant amounts of liquid water on the surface. That's one of the goals of NASA's Mars Perseverance rover mission, to look for signs of ancient Martian life. That's why Perseverance is searching within the Martian rocks for fossils and organisms that once lived, most likely primitive life like Martian microbes. So, do, do it yourself oxygen. Among the seven instruments on board, actually, before I carry on with that one, there's a little bit of a video that I might run. Uh, where's that? There it is. I'll just run this video, but there's no, there won't be any audio associated with it. It's just a visual experience while I, uh, I waffle on. So, let me just run this, and I'll mute that. Harlow. Yes, I'm still there. Good. <laughs> Um, all right, so back to the article. Just just to change the image on the screen, that's that's really all it is. Uh, okay, so do it yourself, oxygen. Among the seven instruments on board the Perseverance's rover is Moxie, M O X I E, an incredible device that takes carbon dioxide out of the Martian atmosphere and turns it into oxygen. If Moxie works the way that scientists hope it will. Future astronauts will not only make their own oxygen, they could use it as a component in rocket fuel that they'll need to fly back to Earth. The more oxygen people are able to make on Mars, the less they'll need to bring from Earth, and the easier it becomes for and and the easier it becomes for visitors to go there. But even with homegrown oxygen, astronauts will still need a space suit. Right now. NASA is working on new technologies needed to send humans to Mars that could happen in the next decade, perhaps sometime during the late 2030s. But then you'll be an adult and maybe one of the first to take a step on Mars. I think that's directed towards the kids, that uh, last statement. So there it is. Um, <laughs> okay, I'll finish with that video playing there. Um, where's, where's me? There is it. Back to me. All right. I might uh, play that. It only goes for uh, about three minutes, uh, that uh, video that I was running. I might run that a little bit later. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. Okay, so the next thing I had here to go, 10.37. Um... The first human landing on an asteroid by 2073, say scientists. Okay, and there's an image there I can bring up too. It's a picture of an asteroid, <laughs> so why not? There it is. Uh, okay, back to the article. Um, people alive today could witness astronauts visiting the asteroid belt within 50 years. The first human space mission to an asteroid belt could take place within 50 years, say rocket engineers, uh, provided humans reach Mars by 2038. Their prediction is based on an economic analysis of the rate of which space budgets increase over time and how humans have increased their sphere of operations since the dawn of space age. The goal of Jonathan Jang at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at Pasadena and colleagues was to work out a time frame over which crewed missions to the asteroid belt to Jupiter and even Saturn might take place. They began by studying how NASA's budget has increased since it formed in 1958. There have been several peaks in this curve corresponding to significant increases in spending. These correspond to 1966 when the Apollo program in, the, in which NASA's budget counted for about 1% of the US gross national product to 1991 when the agencies de decided to partner with the private sector to develop a space shuttle replacement and in 2018 when it embarked on Artemis program to return humans to the moon and then send them on to Mars. The overall trend, however, is of steady, steady linear growth, says Zhang. The team also attempted to measure improvements in technology since deep space missions rely on design, manufacture and operation of complex hardware and life support systems. They do this simply by counting the number of scientific papers published on deep space exploration in the US, year, in the US per year. 
This can be used as a proxy to gauge the overall technology level of cutting-edge developments in this complex realm, says the researchers. The final factor the team uses is the effective radius of human activity beyond Earth. This increased rapid, rapidly as the dawn of space age from low Earth orbit to the first successful moon landing at a distance of 0.0026 astronomical units. The Artemis project will send humans to Mars in about 2037 when the radius of human activity will increase to 0.3763 AU. Assuming this mission is successful, it provides another data point the team can use to project project into the future. Taking all these trends into account allows the team to produce a model that predicts when human emissions to distant parts of the solar system will take place. This model embarks 23 sorry, this model earmarks 2073 for a crewed asteroid belt mission. 2103 for humans to visit Jupiter and its satellites as well as 21 <coughs> as well as 2132 for a mission to Saturn. How about that? Saturn visit. The result thus far suggests that the, the worlds of our solar system throughout humanity human history merely specks of light in the night sky will soon be within our grasp, says the team. Of course predictions of this kind are bedeviled with uncertainty. Some factors such as sudden climate change could make deep space mission more urgent, while others such as diseases like COVID-19 could dramatically slow progress. Ultimately, economic conditions and national priorities will determine the rate of development. But the key message from Jiang and, and uh, co uh, co-workers is that these missions could take place in the not too distant future. They conclude, our model suggests human landings on worlds beyond the moon and Mars may well be witnessed by many alive today. You're tuned to VK3 Echo Kila Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Narry Warren South. All right, now... <laughs> I've lost a picture on my repeater up here, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that there's still a, a, a picture coming through the repeater. Thank you. Yeah, I've got to fix that problem. That's a problem at this end in the shack here. All right, next article, very quickly. We're moving along here. Um, it's all short stories from here. Um, okay, now I've got a picture of this one, so I shall cast this up upon the visions. Where are we? There, There it is. Uh, okay, yep, audio still there, good. Um, this is the Pallades. So what are we talking about? Some of the must-see cosmic objects in this is the Southern Pallades. Get your binoculars out, you'll be able to see this easy. The Southern Pallades, or IC 2602, is one designation for it. In the constellation Carina the Keel is a dazzling open cluster. It lies 550 light years away and occupies a region 50 minutes in diameter. Minutes? Anyway, that's 2.6 times as much the area of the full moon. Degrees, perhaps? Not sure how they've written that there, but anyway. So it occupies an area that's 2.6 times as much area as the m full moon covers. There it is. So, <laughs> so I see 2602 contains about 75 stars surrounding blue magnitude 2.7 Theta Carina. So it's sometimes referred to as the Theta Carina cluster. More commonly, however, observers call it the Southern Pallades because it's discoverer, a French astronomer, Nicolas Louis de Calale, compared it to the Pallades M54 in the northern constellation Taurus the Bull. Okay. Uh, astronomers originally caught IC, sorry, astronomers originally thought IC 2602 was a young object on the order of 15 million years old. Recent studies at the Anglo-Australian Observatory, however, have placed its age closer to 45 million years, which is still hefty, or still pretty pretty young, for an open cluster. With a total magnitude of 1.9, 
which makes it 52% as bright as M45, the Southern Pleiades ranks as the fifth brightest open cluster in the sky. Most observers agree that, as the northern, as with the Northern Pleiades, IC2602 looks better through binoculars. That's because telescopes, uh, though they provide increased magnification, have a more limited field of view and spread out the stars too much. If, however, you can use a short focal length scope telescope with an eyepiece that gives one and a half degree field of view, this collection of stars will knock your socks off. Through such an instrument, it looks like you're viewing two clusters with a 0.3 degree wide gulf between them. The, the westernmost group includes Theta Carina and two curving lines of stars that start at Theta. One heads north and the other south. Some observers think that the eastern half of, the, of IC2602 looks like a tiny Orion. Those stars have different relative brightnesses than those in the winter constellation. So I just thought I'd throw that one in, but that's the image. I'll, oh, I can't see it, but I, I, I'll believe it's there. Um, all right, back to me. What time is it? 46. So it's 40, what's that? Um, 14 minutes to. So next article, chewing along here. Oh yes. Okay. So this is. Uh, oh, this is this is very short. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to make sure I've got time for Tamitha's solar report. Uh, okay. So where are we? Where's this image got to? I've lost it. Uh, or maybe I didn't put it there. Didn't I put it there? Uh, maybe I didn't. Um, sure I did. Oh, there it is. Found it. Got it. All right. Um, okay. So this report is. It's an illusion. The moon is an illusion. No, our sign, our satellite is not really bigger than on the when on the horizon. A lot of people think that, and I'm still struggling with the illusion. I always think the moon's bigger on the horizon, but it ain't. The research still struggle to fully explain the moon illusion, a mystery you can see with naked eye as the full moon rises. Have you ever looked at the nighttime horizon and gasped at the sight of a spectacular large moonrise? Typically, if you glance up at the sky several uh, up at the sky hours later, the moon will seem to have shrunk. Dubbed the moon illusion, this phenomenon has been witnessed for thousands of years, a visual trickery that takes place all in the mind. And even after so long, scientists still disagree on what exactly is happening in our brains. To test it, you can snap a picture of the rising moon on the horizon and compare it to an image taken later that night. The size will remain consistent, even if your eyes deceive in the moment. Similarly, using during a supermoon, when the date of the full moon coincides with the point closest to Earth in the lunar orbit and the moon appears roughly 7% bigger, the naked eye can barely see the increase, even if you conceive, conceive yourself otherwise. Convinced, sorry. <laughs> even if you convince yourself otherwise, not conceive. One common explanation for the illusion is that when the moon is near the horizon, trees or buildings juxtaposed against the sky fool your brain to perceive the moon as closer to Earth, and therefore extra big. But astronauts in orbit also witnessed <coughs> excuse me. But astronauts in orbit also witness the moon illusion without foreground objects, so this doesn't quite solve the problem. While other hypotheses abound, the moon illusion still holds some intrigue for scientists, and anyone who takes the time to sit back and savour the lunar mystery. Okay, there it is. Quick report on that one. Easy peasy. You're tuned to VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. Okay, um, and this one, this one is also short, but I'm not sure if I've got time. Um, let me see. There was one other here. This is. Uh, I'll I'll just run with this because this is kind of current news. Um, oh, I've got no images for this. Okay, so all right. 
Uh, okay, this was published 37 minutes ago. The Earth Will End. <laughs> My sense of humour. Um, you can watch a huge mile-wide asteroid fly safely by Earth today. The asteroid, just over one mile wide, but poses no immediate threat to us. A huge asteroid more than a mile wide will zoom safely by Earth today and you can watch it live today in free online webcast. The asteroid known as Asteroid 7335 or 1989JA is four times the size of the Empire State Building and will pass the Earth at a distance of about ten times that of the space between the Earth and the Moon. It is possible, sorry, it is the <laughs> it is the largest asteroid flyby of 2022, yet but the space rock will remain a perfectly safe distance to our planet. The virtual telescope project will run a webcast of the flyby at 9 a.m. or 1300 hours UTC on May 27. I think this is tomorrow for US and you can watch the flyby in the window above or directly through the project's website. Uh, asteroid 7335 is roughly 1.1 miles or 1.8 kilometers in diameter and its closest approach is quite healthy 2.5 uh, 4, 4 million kilometers away from Earth. The asteroid should be bright enough to glimpse in a moderate sized amateur telescope particularly from southern hemisphere. Uh, virtual telescope project founder Glenu Mast noted. Oh, there's more here. Asteroid 7335 is technically classified as a potentially hazardous, uh, but that it is more designated based uh, more uh, th that it is more a designation based on its relative size, um, uh, 150 meters larger than the distance at which the object approaches Earth, among other factors. You have to read the article. NASA's Planetary Defense Coordination Office has found that the object to be no threat at all, and uh, you can keep track of the prominent upcoming flybys and the agency's small body database to learn more about asteroids, yada, yada, yada. Um, yeah, okay, this is just advertising. So, and I did actually have a picture of the asteroid, a, a image of this, so I'll bring that up quickly. There it is. Um, of course, it's a, it's an artist's impression. It's uh, not, uh, not it's, I think they're just showing its scale against the Earth. Maybe. I doubt it, though. It's not real. No, it's not. <laughs> anyway, there it is. It's, uh, it's, I just thought I'd show that. All right, look, I'm going to run uh, Tamitha's report. Um, so let me hope that this all works out okay. Um, and uh, we'll see how we go with uh, Tamitha's report. Let's just bring that up again. There it is. And uh, now I've just got to make sure the audio works here for everybody who's listening on HF. So um, let me just do this. We have multiple big flare players on the Earth-facing disk, several filaments poised to erupt, but as of yet, no Earth-directed solar storms. Those stories are more in the news this week. This space weather forecast is sponsored in part by Millersville University. Come get certified in broadcast space weather. Visit millersville.edu slash swen. Space weather this week is leaving us wanting. As we take a look at the Earth-facing disk, it sure looks lively, but believe it or not, all of this activity has not really affected Earth all that much. Now, we do have a coronal hole that's been rotating in through the Earth strike zone. It sent us some fast solar wind over the last day or so, and that has brought us just a tiny bit of activity. We bumped up to active conditions for a very short while, but things are already beginning to wane. And if we take a look at all of the bright regions on the Earth facing disk, believe it or not, we do have some big flare players. The main player is region 3014. It has been firing off some decent M-class flares, and it actually is an X-flare player, just a tiny bit. But along with region uh, 3011 and 3018 in the south, and also 3019 on the east, these regions have not brought us anything in terms of big solar storm launches. We've gotten a little wispy things to the east and to the west of us, but that's been about it. Meanwhile, we also have a crescent-shaped 
a coronal hole that's going to be rotating in through the Earth strike zone probably sometime this upcoming week, and that could give us yet another small uh, chance for aurora, but probably not something that's super intense. So we're just going to be taking a look and waiting for solar storms to potentially erupt. We do have uh, several filaments in the south. One actually launched on the 19th, and the other one is in the Earth strike zone right now, and we're watching it very closely because if it were to erupt now, it could lead to an Earth-directed solar storm. So there's a lot of potential on the Earth-facing disk, but not too much happening in terms of Earth impacts as of yet. Now, as we take a look at our far-sighted sun, this is stereo A, and it's looking at the sun just a little bit from the side. You can see all of these active regions, and sure enough, some of the pops and fizzles from all of the different big flare players. In fact, as we take a look at the east limb in stereo's view, you can definitely see two big regions that are rotating into view in stereo, and they are firing some solar storms and possibly some big flares. So we do have potential for more activity uh, rotating into Earth view here over the next few days, and this is definitely boosting that solar flux up. We're sitting in like the 170s right now, so radio propagation on Earth's day side has been wonderful in between some of the radio blackouts, and from Stereo's view, it looks like it's going to continue to be that way over this next week, and once again, we do have more chances for solar storms if the sun would ever launch any. Switching to our moon, we are now passing through the third quarter phase on our way to a new moon, with the new moon being on the 30th. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, the chances are getting better every day. But you're going to need to check your local rise and set times. Switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are experiencing that fast solar wind from that coronal hole that's rotating in through the Earth strike zone now. At high latitudes, NOAA is expecting active conditions with up to about a 30% chance of a major storm. But this is going to calm down over the next couple days and kind of linger for a little bit, and things will then quiet down as we move in through the week. At mid latitudes, we're only expecting unsettled conditions, but we do have up to about a 25% chance of active conditions. So aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you could definitely get some aurora that lasts for the next couple days, but at mid latitudes, well, only if you're dedicated should you chase it all, because likely things are really not going to last all that long, and uh, things will be pretty quiet here until about next week sometime when you could get another chance for more aurora. Switching to our solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming week, we do have a lot of flare activity on the Earth-facing disk this week, and that means radio blackouts are still on the menu. In fact, NOAA's giving us about a 40% chance of M-class flares and about a 5% chance of X-class flares over the next couple days. And this is mainly due to region 3014, because that's the big player right now. But there are other regions that we're keeping our eyes on. The nice thing is that means that the solar flux has been boosted into the 160s and in the 170s. It kind of is bouncing back and forth between the two, and that means great radio propagation on Earth's day side in and around the radio blackouts, but it's not such great news for GPS users. So if you happen to be a GPS user, watch out near dawn and near dusk, because that's where things in, your, in terms of your reception could get a little bit dicey over this week. But radio propagation should stay on the good side. Now, we also sadly do have a chance for uh, particle radiation storms this week. We have NOAA's giving us about a 10% chance of a radiation storm, and this is mainly due to region 3014. And as that region rotates off of the sun's west limb, this risk is going to stay elevated. So if you are a frequent flyer, and you, uh, or, and that includes air crew who fly over 800 hours annually and fly at high latitudes and high altitudes, just be aware and stay vigilant because we will have this risk for us over the next couple days. So the space weather this week continues to be on the lively side. We do have a lot of flare activity on the Earth-facing disk, but believe it or not, we don't have any big solar storms that are launched. We are watching one filament that's rotating in through the Earth strike zone right now, and it's poised to erupt, but until it does, we won't have any big Earth-directed solar storms. Just a little bit of effect from some fast solar wind that could bring aurora to high latitudes. Outside of that, we're going to have to wait till basically next week before 
before we see any more fast solar wind come and give us more chances for aurora so your aurora photographers especially down at mid latitudes just kind of hang out and wait because something's bound to change here soon now amateur radio operators and emergency responders well you guys are probably loving life right now because the solar flux is boosted way up into the 160s and 170s and this is easily going to continue over the next week as we have even more regions rotating into earth view so enjoy the radio propagation in and around the radio blackouts of when they happen and that's going to be an issue easily for the next three or four days before, until region uh, 3014 rotates off of the earth facing disk and now for you M uh, gps users well you know these radio blackouts aren't so much fun for you especially if you're near dawn and dusk and also that solar flux you definitely don't like it when it rises so high so if you happen to be at low latitudes on earth's day side or if you happen to be near dawn and dusk definitely stay vigilant because gps reception could be a little dicey i'm tamitha scove the space weather woman thank you for watching Okay, thank you, uh, Timotha Scove, uh, for uh, her solo report. And um, uh, even though it uh, kind of covers uh, the last uh, uh, three or four days, it's still uh, uh, is giving us a bit of an idea of what's coming up uh, over this weekend, at least. Well, <coughs> let's uh, go to spaceweather.com, and we'll just cover that as the last thing for tonight. Um, all right. Uh, the solar wind is currently at 326.1 kilometers a second at a density of 33.85 protons per cubic centimeter. Uh, there are currently 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, <laughs> 7 sunspots on the disk of the sun as I speak and I can bring up that latest image as well there. So there it is. Uh, current uh, uh, view of our sun with the uh, designated uh, uh, solar or sunspots activity. Uh, <coughs> sunspot number to date is 87 and the radio sun is at 137 solar flux units, 137 solar flux units measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimeters. Uh, also a geomagnetic storm watch uh, there is a minor G1 class geomagnetic storm uh, possible on May 28 uh, when a CME is expected to sideswipe Earth's magnetic field. The solar storm could, or should, I should say uh, cloud, was hurtled into space by an unstable magnetic filament which erupted on May 25. Um, so I've also got the latest image of the current aurora oval over Antarctica. I'll just bring that up. There it is. <coughs> so uh, that's the uh, the current view of uh, the aurora over Antarctica. So it's nothing uh, too, uh, too extreme. Uh, there might be any visual auroras occurring um, at the mainland or Tasmania at this point, I would say. That's the, the current uh, image being created. Um, all right, so I think that's about it. Uh, uh, as of May 27, uh, there is 2,279 potentially hazardous asteroids. And uh, one of those is the one we mentioned before. All right, so that's space weather in a nutshell. Um, they've got a magnificent image here of... Uh, of uh, 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 sprites uh, from distant lightning uh, images too so just just go to spaceweather.com um, and uh, even though the image is uh, talking about something else in, in the image but the uh, the sprites which are uh, ex extended lightning um, activity above the clouds uh, from thunderstorm activity and they call them sprites it's uh, quite uh, quite amazing to see Okay, I think uh, from there we shall conclude this session for this week. Uh, I thank everybody for uh, uh, listening in tonight and um, and viewing. And um, 
we'll be back again next Friday uh, to do it all again. And uh, uh, to the, the folks on the chat window there, uh, Martin, VK7JH, uh, Richard, VK3VRS, and uh, Kim, VK5FUSE, also have joined in. Uh, and uh, to the fellows that have sent me emails today, Don uh, and Andrew and Stuart um, have all sent in reports today, which was um, very good. So uh, excellent stuff indeed. All right, we shall conclude transmissions on the medium wave surface and uh, conclude on 1865. So any stations uh, wishing to send in reports, by all means, can uh, do it on 80 metres, switch your bands to 3541 kilohertz in the 80 metre amateur radio band, and we'll pick up uh, the uh, a quick callback there. So this is VK3 EKH uh, concluding our transmission on 1865 kilohertz, and uh, uh, we'll be back again next week to do it all again. Thanks for listening on 1865 AM. This is VK3 EKH. All right, standby stations on 3541. Uh, we've got a pen and paper, and I think we're ready to go. Yep. So, any stations wishing to call in, please go now. This is VK3 EKH. Okay, <clears throat> I hope my uh, headphones still on. <laughs> uh, I think VK3JR was there, VK3VIN, VK3HDX, and VK3BSE. I think was the last station I heard. Uh, is there anybody I missed? Oh, there's a VK6 sitting in there. <laughs> Hang on, VK6. Uh, we've got VK3GL. And there, there was another station just after VK3GL. Oh, okay. It was VK7. All right. J-A-H. All right. Uh, okay, so we have uh, VK3JR, VK3VIN, VK3HDX. VK3BSC, VK3GL, VK7JAH. Now, there was a VK6. I'm pretty sure it was a VK6 I heard. Uh, try again, the VK6 station. Oh, extremely weak. <laughs> Just try again. Okay, VK six something Sierra Foxtrot. VK six something Sierra Foxtrot. They just uh, didn't catch that first letter. Try again. Oh. QSL, QSL the Yankee. VK six YSF. We got you that time. All right, just just um, give me a second here. <coughs> uh, all right. That's not a, not a bad uh, callback, so to speak. Uh, Frank, VK3JR, VK3EKH. VK3EKH. Thanks, Frank. VK3JR, VK3EKH. Thanks very much, uh, uh, dear sir. And uh, likewise, you're about 20 over 9, so um, not doing too bad. It looks like the uh, propagation on uh, 80 metres is good tonight. <laughs> so maybe I could have run a, a really good AM signal tonight on, on 80. It would have been interesting. Anyway, maybe next week, huh? Um, thanks, Frank. Uh, say good day to, uh, to Steve, too, for us a little later on. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> G'day, Steve. You, you might be watching, or listening as well. Um, all right, Ian, VK3VIN, VK3EKH. Good on you, and VK3 VIN, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel returning, and uh, thank you for the report. And uh, yes, uh, look, uh, probably the easiest thing for me to say is if you go to space.com, www.space.com, uh, and look for the uh, the uh, article on the asteroid. Um, it's the uh, the article is called "You Can Watch a Huge Mile Wide Asteroid Fly Safely by Earth Today." Uh, published 37 minutes ago, or well, if, if I refresh the screen, let me just refresh that. <laughs> there we are, two hours ago now. <laughs> um, so you can, it's the article's called "You Can Watch a Huge Mile Wide Asteroid Fly Safely by Earth," published two hours ago, and right below uh, where it says the asteroid just over one mile wide but poses no immediate threat to us is the link to the YouTube stream that will. Uh, uh, be occurring at some stage this weekend and I totally agree uh, the the Americans always love to uh, only look at themselves and think yep this is uh, you know it's only Americans that are going to be watching uh, what we're doing so nobody else is interested so <laughs> but they do provide UTC mind you uh, let me see um, yeah the, the virtual telescope project will run a webcast of the flyby at 9 a.m. EDT Eastern Daylight Time, uh, or 
1300 UTC on May 27. That's their May 27. Uh, so yeah, you got, you've got to do this mental buddy uh, figuring out um, of how that correlates to what, what time here in uh, in Melbourne or Australia. So uh, yeah, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. Uh, but uh, certainly, um, <coughs> uh, the best thing I can suggest is just go to the space.com uh, website and look for the uh, article. I think it's under science astronomy. So when you go to space.com, www.space.com, it's home news science and astronomy. So the article is under their science and astronomy uh, heading. There it is. Okay. All right. Now, next on the list uh, is is who was it after? Ian, it's Don VK three HDX VK three EKH. Have a say, Don. Yeah, thanks, Clint. VK three EKH and the group VK three HDX. Great broadcast tonight. Now I know you said last week you uh, you thought people um, wanted to hear less of you after your experiment last week. I don't think that's true because while it was a great broadcast last week and really enjoyed the astrophys interviews, always do. Um, it was a really good mix of articles tonight and it was most interesting. So, um, so thanks for that. Uh, enjoyed it and um, we'll look forward to next week. I'll listen to 160 in a high five AM. <laughs> it sounded fantastic. I had the pictures up on, the, up on the screen as well from YouTube. So uh, we'll look forward to next week to VK3 EKH and the group VK3 HDX. Thanks, Don. VK3HDX, VK3EKH. Much appreciated. Your comments are always welcome. So, or everybody's comments are welcome. Uh, <laughs> uh, but um, no, it's uh, it really does uh, lift uh, uh, the spirits here for sure. <laughs> uh, thanks, Don. Really good. And um, yeah, I, I thought I'd just run the, the normal run of the mill uh, tonight. So. That's usually how it goes. Um, all right, we have, I think it's John, VK3 uh, Bravo Sierra Echo, was it? VK3 BSE, VK3 EKH. Thanks, John. Uh, VK3 BSE, VK3 EKH. <clears throat> Excellent. Thank you very much uh, for your report. Um, you're hovering about 10 to 20 over 9, uh, peaking about 20. So not doing too bad for that vertical. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, I suppose there's a place for a vertical antenna on 80. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I think um, if you can run a, a normal dipole, the, I think it's or inverted V, it's probably uh, a little better, really because it's just just thinking of the noise pick up really um, but nevertheless uh, yeah look uh, propagation on HF I think as we all can contest is improving vastly uh, I'm hearing reports all the time about uh, propagation is uh, is just blown out of the water on 20 meters and 15 and even 10 meters uh, so um, 
uh, we're, we're still on the increase of the uh, the solar cycle. So on, honestly, the the next 12, 18 months is just going to uh, HF uh, comms is just going to be a bit of fun uh, for all of us. So uh, uh, yeah, um, bring on the solar cycle, more solar sunspot activity, and more coronial mass ejections, and uh, <laughs> the more fun for amateur radio operators. Maybe we get lucky and some of the Leon Musk satellites will get entirely knocked out of orbit. <laughs> anyway, all right. Um, thanks, John. Thanks very much for coming up. Really good. Uh, Mr. Lewis, VK3GL, VK3EKH. Yes, okay, Clint. Very good evening to you, VK3EKH. Uh, I'm Thanks, Graham. VK3GL, VK3EKH returning. VK3CSJ on the microphone. Um, yeah, that's the Leon Musk Starlink satellites, and there's um, there's hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of them already up there in low Earth, Earth orbit, uh, and that's what they that's what happens. They uh, get launched from the the rocket in a in a string, and they shoot across the sky, uh, maybe 20 or 30 in a row. And then once they finally reach their uh, parked orbits, or, or the respective uh, orbits, they then get uh, manoeuvred into their um, p final resting spots. Um, <coughs> so yes, you are lucky to um, actually see the uh, 
the tra tail end of, or the beginning of the, the launch of uh, the uh, Starlink system and they all, they've all gone through that process and there's been quite a few photographs taken, images of these satellites that go across the sky in a line. Uh, I haven't, I've yet to see it, uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah. But I've, there was actually an image that I saw earlier this week which I thought to put up tonight which uh, uh, shows you a, a bit of a time-lapse uh, image um, taken of all these satellites crisscrossing criss, criss the sky and um, it really is making it uh, very difficult for astronomers to, uh, to take good images of the sky. just depends on the time of the night really. Anyway, thanks Graeme. Uh, was there anything else? Um, uh, good, yeah, you're certainly hearing um, Peter a lot better than uh, than I am. It's going to be a bit of a struggle to hear the VK6 station. Um, all right, thanks, Gray, and hopefully we'll be uh, around uh, this weekend. I've got a little bit of work to do on the car, and um, uh, I've got some pop someone popping around briefly tomorrow, uh, and um, there's a little bit of gardening I need to try and do before the weather goes wet. So, yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll see if I'm around. <laughs> All right, thanks, Graham. Uh, Martin, VK7JAH in Launceston. Have a say. VK7JAH, VK3EKH. Yeah, a little bit hard copy tonight, Martin. Um, I only really picked up just a few words. <laughs> um, just a little bit tricky to hear you uh, tonight. You, you were far better last, uh, certainly last week, but um, but uh, tonight, yeah, just a bit of a hard copy uh, on you. So um, not sure the reason for that. But um, anyway, thanks for uh, for calling him, and um, we've got you logged. All right, <laughs> thanks, Martin. Uh, now, VK6YCF. Now, I'm, I'm going to have some trouble hearing you. Uh, I think it's Peter, uh, but we'll give it, give it a go. VK6YSF, VK6 Yankee Sierra Fox, VK3EKH. Have a go. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Not a problem. VK6YSF, VK3EKH. Um, good copy. You, you're 5 and 9 plus 10. Uh, 5 and 9 plus 10, hovering around the 10. <laughs> so when you first called in, honestly, when you f first called in, I, I was struggling to uh, to hear you. Uh, so uh, you're quite correct. The uh, propagation has, uh, has, uh, has uh, seemingly improved towards the west. So that's, that's really excellent. Um, thanks for calling in, uh, Peter. And uh, I, look, I, I've been doing the broadcast for uh, over 12 years, and um, uh, you know, during that time, we we do get uh, the occasional VK6 that's the, that calls in, and I'm, I'm always uh, happy to, for VK6s to call in because it's a it's a good distance across the country, and um, uh, uh, well, you're coming through very well tonight, indeed. So um, excellent uh, signal, and it's just improved. Quite uh, taken, uh, taken back by that. Um, yeah, okay. So, um, uh, Northam, according to QRZ.com, you're in a uh, location called Northam. So, um, not a problem. Excellent stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I'll just I'll, I'll pop it back to you just briefly there, Peter. VK6YSF, VK3EKH.
Oh, you suddenly disappeared. Did you put it back to me or uh, did you drop off? Oh, he disappeared. VK six YSF, VK six YSF, VK three EKH. Uh, you just disappeared there, uh, Peter. All of a sudden, sounded <laughs> just sounded like a power failure. <laughs> Oh damn! Well, there it is. That's what happens to uh, you know, when the caller drops out. <laughs> the mobile phone goes bad. Um, <laughs> anyway, all right. No worries, Peter. Thanks very much for calling in. And uh, yeah, like I say, the, the, the signal's been pretty good. Five and nine plus ten, and a um, little bit of QSB, but um, uh, all very good. And I, I, I think you were talking about the uh, the satellites uh, stringing across the sky. <coughs> um, uh, if uh, if you all go to um, uh, astronomy, no, sorry, um, heavens above. That's the website. Uh, just type it in your favourite search engine, uh, heavensabove.com. Uh, they have um, uh, predictions of when a lot of objects will be in the sky. All amateur satellites, um, celestial objects, and uh, I'm pretty sure. Uh, though it will also include any new satellites uh, that are being launched by Leon Musk. So, heavens above, heavensabove.com. Um, it's actually heaven, heavens-above.com uh, or underscore uh, to uh, to say, but you'll uh, type it in the search engine, you'll get it. But yeah, all information should be able to get from uh, heavens above. All right, uh, we'll just uh, take one more listen for any other stations wishing to check in, uh, or if Peter's back, VK3 EKH listening. Uh, VK2, what's say it again? Alpha Juliet. VK2 Alpha Juliet uh, didn't quite get that last one. Got it. VK2 Alpha Juliet Mexico AGM. All right. Um, have a say. VK2 Alpha Juliet Mexico VK3 EKH. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. VK2 AJM, VK2 AJM, VK3 EKH. Very good. Uh, th thanks, Andrew. Just uh, quickly checked up on the QRZ.com page. QRZ is your friend, isn't it? Um, yeah, thanks, Andrew. And uh, uh, Kurambong. All right. Not sure exactly where that is in the scheme of things, but uh, we'll take a look on the map later. Um, but thanks, Andrew. Your uh, readability 4.5, um, not, uh, not super strong here. Um, but rootability four to five and uh, about strength nine-ish. Um, I, I, because I'm in a suburb here in Melbourne, it's I've got to put up with local noise. It's it's such an issue. Um, it always makes things difficult. But uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Andrew. We we broadcast every Friday. I don't know whether you've uh, listened to the broadcast before, uh, but uh, yeah, we we broadcast every Friday night. We kick off at ten o'clock uh, for um, on behalf of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, the ASV. And uh, we've been doing it now for uh, 12 years. The broadcast has actually been going to air since 1988, uh, so uh, it's been going for quite a quite a while on uh, on this frequency. And uh, since I've taken over, uh, I've just thrown in so many other modes of operation, including the the TV. So. Uh, uh, all very good. You can find out, find out more information, uh, qrz.com page, just type in vk3ekh in qrz.com and uh, all will be revealed there. <laughs> thanks Andrew, thanks very much for calling in, much uh, appreciated. Alright, well look, there's no other stations, um, we'll, uh, we'll close down for tonight, it's, um, it's 24 minutes to, uh, uh, to the hour, so um, I'll just take one more listen, vk3ekh. No worries. Thanks everybody for calling in tonight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight stations. It's really good. Not bad at all. 
This is VK3 Echo Killer Hotel. I th uh, and everybody that's on the chat window there, uh, Martin, Richard, and uh, Kim, and uh, to the folks up there on the uh, the email. Thanks very much, for everybody, and to all those watching on YouTube. Uh, we get about we average about 20 uh, viewers on the YouTube channel a week. So, you know, I don't pr promote the uh, the channel in any general way, but um, it's it's nice to see that uh, there's up to uh, 20 uh, a week that ch checks out the the YouTube. <laughs> side of it so I guess it's alright anyway this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel with VK3 CSJ on the microphone concluding the transmissions to tonight for this 27th and uh, we'll be back next Friday which will be let me just check that uh, date uh, where's this mouse there it is um, it will be it will be the 3rd 3rd of June so uh, we'll start off next week's uh, uh, article with uh, the sky notes from the planetarium and uh, what's up in the sky. This is VK3 EKH. Uh, more information about the society can be found at the uh, website www.asv.org.au. This is VK3 EKH, VK3 CSJ concluding transmissions on 3541. Good night all, thanks very much for listening. Okay, thanks folks watching YouTube, wrong camera, that camera, uh, we'll be back, <laughs> uh, just a sec bro, um, <laughs> so uh, we shall conclude the transmission on the YouTube stream, so thanks uh, for those uh, folks that have been watching tonight, and um, uh, we'll be back all again next Friday to do it all again, so uh, let me just... Um, Oh, that's not going to work when I do that. Okay, one one thing at a time here. And uh, I lost my ID, didn't I? All right. <laughs> Cheers, everyone. Take care. Bye for now.